Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, a weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives. Income, debts, jobs, job security, all of it. For ourselves, for our kids, for the community we live in. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. I've been a professor of economics all my adult life, and my hope is that it's prepared me to be a useful analyst of the last week's major economic events. So let's get right to it. Over the last week, the intensity with which the European authorities are cracking down on Uber have really made the news. Uber is making enemies faster than it's making friends, at least in Europe. And the authorities are responding to the anger and upset of their own people by fining Uber and finding it uh, doing things that they don't want to have done there. At the same time, I've been getting a number of emails from many of you asking me why I'm critical of Uber, asking me what's wrong with the gig economy. After all, it gives people more flexibility uh, in doing their work in the manner of Uber and so on. So I'm going to take a few minutes to go over this material, helping to understand why the Europeans feel as strongly as they do and why the Americans may in fact pretty soon catch up to what the Europeans are already doing in this area. So let's begin. And the way to do this, as with so many important issues, is to go back a little bit and do the history. Many industries deal directly with the public. That is, they provide a good or a service to the public. And in the history of capitalism, this has always bred real problems pretty soon. Why? because a capitalist enterprise is there to make money for the people who own and operate the enterprise. That's their prime goal, that's why they go into the business, and that's what makes them succeed, if indeed they do. So that's their first concern, the famous so-called bottom line. So let's take the example of a company that provides taxi rides. Company owns and operates a fleet of cabs, hires cabbies, and they provide us with transportation. What happened when the automobile industry developed in the last century was that pretty soon every city and quite some towns had a cab company working there. And the cab company wanted to make a profit. And so the cab company, sooner or later, not all the companies, but many of them, began to use shortcuts, I'm being polite here, in order to make more profits. What do I mean? Well, they didn't maintain the cars quite as carefully as they might have. They didn't buy expensive insurance policies just in case there was an accident. They weren't so careful about who they hired as a cabbie so that they could pay lower wages, being quite aware that that might mean people who wouldn't be good as cab drivers might get the job, etc., etc. And the predictable happened. Cars didn't work. Cars had accidents. Drivers of cars didn't treat the passengers very well. And so a demand arose from the riding public, hey, this isn't safe to get into a cab car. We're having injuries. We're having ugly experiences. We don't want this. What do you do to solve the problem? The way it was solved was not to admit that there's a problem when you want to provide a service for people and you put that job in the hands of a profit-making enterprise whose first objective is profit. There wasn't an honest facing that this is a dangerous situation because there are countless ways in which making more profit can be not so good for the service you're supposed to provide. Cab driving was just one example. So here was the solution. A commission was established. The government was called in, set up a taxi and limousine commission, for example. That's what it's called in New York City, but other communities have that too. And the commission made the following rule. 
there must be such and such inspection to maintain the quality of the car. There must be such and such an insurance policy in effect. There must be these and these qualifications for cab drivers. All of those things have to be met or else you can't be a cab company in this community. These were, of course, the very expensive things that the cab companies had avoided. So the commission solved the problem by setting the cab rates, what we pay to have a uh, ride in a taxi cab, high enough so that the cab company could make a profit and pay for what was necessary to provide a public service. It was a stark recognition, never spoken in so many words, that if you leave it to the private capitalist motive, it isn't safe. You have to bring in the government representing the interests of the people to get the quality of service that you want. And so it came to be that cab drivers were in safe vehicles, well insured, properly vetted, etc. And we paid the rates that made that all possible, plus a profit. Well, no sooner is this done than the very solution I've described creates the incentive for what? For Uber. What do I mean? For some company to come in, find some excuse, some way to be able to offer the cab services at the nice high prices that the commission had set and yet not pay the high wages, the insurance policies, the maintenance fees that the other company, in other words, they would then have a real big profit. They'd get the high rates set by the commission or the equivalent, but they wouldn't have to pay what was required of the existing tab companies. All that Uber is, is the latest effort to do exactly that. They had a new technology. They made a big thing about the new technology. Then they made a big thing about every driver is on his own or on her own. Work the hours they want, when they want. The flexible gig economy. The new way of doing business. Free, flexible hours for workers. Isn't it wonderful? That was the hoopla. That was the hype. Underneath, it was a very old game. We're going to get taxi prices without taxi costs because we're going to not maintain the cars, not going to insure the cars, and allow anybody and his brother or sister to drive a cab or to drive an Uber car. Guess what? around the world exactly now is happening what happened in the cab companies in the history. What? The insurance isn't adequate, the cars aren't properly maintained, the drivers are not reliable, safe, vetted people, and the results are history repeating itself, which is why there's an outrage around the world led by the Europeans these days saying, what in the world are we doing? We're simply redoing our own history. We know how badly this story ends. There shouldn't be an Uber. Or to say the same thing another way, we have taxis. We have worked through this problem. If Uber wants to run a taxi business, they have to abide by all the same rules and regulations that we've worked out to make this system work. Hidden again is the wonderful assumptions that if you leave public services to private capitalist enterprises sooner or later, and it's usually sooner, you're going to have to bring the government in because relying on capitalists isn't a smart way to do business in the public service. My next update is very short. It's a comment on a uh, sitting senator. He's Senator Ron Johnson, Republican from the state of Wisconsin. At a meeting widely circulated through the internet, he was asked, a public meeting, he was asked by a student, isn't health care a human right? In other words, shouldn't everybody, by virtue of being a human being, be entitled to medical care 
if and when he or she gets sick, suffers an injury, etc. Uh, Senator Ron Johnson gave a forthright answer. I'm going to read it to you and then make a brief comment. Here's what the senator said. What we have as rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have the right to freedom. Past that point, everything else is a limited resource that we have to use our opportunities given to us so that we can afford those things. What the good senator is saying is the following. If you're born into a rich family, then the quote-unquote opportunities given to you are enormous and you will be able to afford, for example, health care. And if the, uh, you happen to be born into a poor family, well then, the opportunities given to you, the senator's words, will not allow you to afford health care. This is a none too subtle way of saying, we're not giving anything to anybody who's not rich enough to pay for it. We're not going to inquire how one person got something given to them that another person didn't, through no fault of their own, new th through no mistake, error, nothing. We're going to keep the status quo. The rich will get and the poor won't. He hasn't the decency or the honesty to say what he means. He uses the fancy language, but a United States senator wants to make sure that if you're poor and get sick or hurt, you're on your own. Third update for today. I really just want to shout out to the nation of Norway. They did something extraordinary and they deserve for the world to know. Last week, the Norwegians decided for the first time in their history, and I believe it's the first time in the history of any country that I know of, that the male and female athletes trained and representing the state of Norway in competitions across the sports will be paid the same amount of money. In the past, the males were paid more. If you look at the situation of sports in most countries, certainly the United States, male athletes are paid much, much more, sometimes many multiples of what women doing pretty much the same sport are paid. But I want to see that everybody understands what this step by the courageous Norwegians who put their equality commitments right up front. We're going to pay men and women engaged in training and becoming professional athletes, representing our country, the same pay. They work as hard, they train as hard, they're intense in their commitment, they deserve the same pay. I'm happy to say that the male athletes supported it and indeed donated part of their pay to make the equalization work. What I like about it, what I want you to think about, here is a society that is deciding that the equality between men and women is an important value and that they're going to pay people according to the values they believe in. They're not going to pay people according to the market, are they? They're not going to say, gee, more people come to male games than to female games and buy the tickets or watch the TV. Is that a relevant factor? I'm sure it is. But there's something that's also important to them, and in this case, more important, perhaps, and that is the equality between men and women. Isn't it interesting that there are societies who set wages not by letting the market decide, but by letting the values of a community democratically arrived at make that decision? I want next to turn to a recent article written by Ralph Nader, a name that many of you know. And he wrote an article in which he criticized capitalist corporations in the United States and elsewhere for using the profits they earn as corporations in order to go into the stock market 
and buy shares of the company's own stock. Let me explain what Ralph Nader was talking about. I assume everyone understands what a corporation is. It hires a lot of workers. I'll take as an example General Motors. It hires many tens of thousands of workers to produce cars and trucks and so on. And it sells those cars and trucks, and it makes enough money when it sells the cars and trucks to pay for all the costs of producing those trucks, the metal, the paint, the plastic, and so on, pays for running the factories, pays for the robots, and also pays the wages for the workers. But it pays all those costs knowing that there's a difference between the revenue they get from selling the cars made by their workers and the costs of having those cars produced. And that difference, revenue minus costs, are the profits of General Motors. Who decides what to do with the profits? The board of directors. This is sort of interesting. All 150, 200,000 workers of GM help to produce the profits. But the board of directors, roughly 15 people, decide what to do with them. There's no democracy there. Let me state it again. Hundreds of thousands of people help to produce the profits. 15 individuals decide what to do with them. They can use them to advertise the GM car. They can use them to build factories in China. They can use them you name it. But here's another thing they can do. They can use the money, the profits they earned, to go into the stock market and buy shares of General Motors. That's perfectly legal. It's done all the time. But of course it's interesting because if they do that, they're not creating jobs with those profits, are they? They're not expanding production. They're not buying more machines. They're not hiring more workers. Instead, they're buying shares of stock. And now why would the board of directors do that? Well, it might be that a bunch of those directors, all of them, some of them, the key ones, who knows? But it might be that they own shares privately as individuals, perfectly legal. So if the company goes into the stock market and buys a lot of shares, it'll drive up the price of the shares, which they as individuals own. So they can then sell their individual shares at the higher price. Their position as an executive of the company, as a director, was now able to advance their wealth as an individual. Using the profits all the workers made, they enhanced their own position, Ralph Nader, calls them out. Ralph has a point. He's not the only one who said this, but I want to draw out the implications. Why do we have an economic system that allows tens of thousands of people to work to produce a profit that is then the property of somebody else? People on the board of directors of General Motors have never helped make a car. They don't do that now. They don't get their hands dirty. How did they come to be in a position not only to decide what to do with the profits, but to be free to do that in a way that personally benefits them rather than providing the jobs and economic growth that the majority of the people undoubtedly want? That's how our system works, and that's something to think about, isn't it? The next update is about Japan. It's about Japan, but it's a problem we all have. In Japan, there has been a scandal of recent weeks about something which, and pardon my pronunciation here, is called karoshi. In English, K-A-R-O-S-H-I. Karoshi roughly means exhaustion from overwork. It is so serious a problem in Japan that two recent cases have come to light and caused a national anguish and a national discussion. The first example, a young woman, aged 31 years old, named Miwa Sado. Uh, she died of congestive heart failure at the age of 31 
in her home in July of 2013. Her family said she had been covering local and national elections for a television station and had worked 159 hours of overtime in the month before she worked. A 40-hour week, roughly four weeks per month, means that you're working about 160 hours. If she worked 159 hours of overtime, she was doing double the normal amount of work that a person should do. Labor officials investigated and discovered that her death was caused by overwork. That's the official Japanese government determination. But the, the details of that were only made public this last week. Wow. NHK, the name of the television station that employed her, issued a public apology. Wow. A public apology. The second case was that of Matsuri Takahashi. He worked in an advertising agency named Dentsu, and he died, a 24-year-old young man, he died, and again, the labor ministry in Japan ruled that his death was from overwork. He was fined, the company, Dentsu, was fined and had to pay 500,000 Japanese yen. But that works out to 4,400 U.S. dollars. That was the determination of a Tokyo court. It was illegal, the court said, to make a person work like that. Why do I bring this up? I bring it up because it's an example, yet again, that the profit-driven imperatives that govern capitalist enterprises intrinsically have no limit. Sure, there are rules and regulations designed to limit because we kind of understand that capitalism drives people to this sort of thing. But what we keep discovering is that corporations have ways to get around those limits, to not pay attention, to hide it, often for long periods of time, until there's a national scandal and a lot of outrage and a lot of gnashing of teeth. But if we don't deal with the problem, if we just pass another rule, if we impose another little fine, we're not dealing with the problem because the problem is systemic. It has to do with a system that drives otherwise perfectly good and nice people to do things to one another that are unconscionable, such as having a 24-year-old and a 31-year-old die from overwork in a society that admits that this is an endemic problem across the society. My next update has to wait until I remind you, please, to know that we maintain two websites that are available for your use. And what I mean by your use is that you partner with us. That's why we do this work in the hopes that you find it interesting, but also that you will share it with other people and therefore extend our reach. The first website is rdwolf with two Fs dot com. And the second one, democracy at work dot info. All one word, democracy at work, dot info. Let me say to our listeners that if you would like to see this as a television program, it is available to you at patreon.com. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash economic update, and you can see the televised version. Make use of these things. Be a partner with us. We want to partner with you. Also, the websites, I should add, uh, allow you to communicate with us what you like and don't like, what you would like us to cover, allow you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and so on. Lots of resources available for you. The next update is about New York City, but my guess is it applies to many other cities. Here's the blunt, hard fact covered by the New York Times in a recent story. 10% of New York City public school pupils were homeless part of the time last year. 10%. How many is that? 
111,500 students in New York City schools were homeless during the last academic year. If you take the state of New York, which includes much more than New York City, well then it's 148,000 students. Beside it being an un unspeakable tragedy that we are allowing this, I want to pick one particular aspect of it and make sure it's clear. There have been a hundred studies and the New York Times story documents them. Studies that show that a homeless child falls behind in school. He or she has to move from one relative to the next, in one school, out of another, out of school altogether for weeks at a time. All of these things are reasons why their reading, their math skills, and so on will slip behind. Since, of course, these are young kids who come from poor households by and large, troubled households, what this means is we are keeping the poor poor. There's no mobility here. You're giving the disadvantage of poverty a boost by adding the disadvantage of less schooling than is needed because of the homelessness. And let's remember, the children who are homeless are not responsible for their homelessness. You might want to blame their parents. You might want to blame that they don't earn enough money to be in a home. But you can't blame the kids. You can only make them suffer or choose not to. And in this society, the choice is all too obvious. Last update for which we have time. President Trump and the GOP are telling us that we have to reduce our 35% tax on the profits of corporations. I could call it lots of polite names. I don't have the time. These are lies. Why are they lies? Because corporations have exemptions and deductions that are available to them, legal, under the law, that in fact make them pay a much lower rate of taxes than the 35%. In fact, in economics, we call the 35% the legal rate, but we call what they actually pay the effective rate. A recent story carried by Market Watch basically tells the truth here. It looked at the 30 industrials that make up the Dow average, the number you hear when you are told whether the stock market went up or down. The Dow 30 industrials. If you add together the federal income tax rate they pay and any state and local taxes they pay, out of the 30 industrials, one paid more than 35%. All of the others paid less. To say that American businesses are suffering from the 35% rate misrepresents the story. The biggest corporations in America haven't paid 35% in many years. They don't need and they don't deserve a tax cut. We've come to the end of the first half of this show. Please stay with us. We will be right back.